Hi everybody, I'm David Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. We are so glad you're here. Mm -hmm. We wish you were really here with <laughs> yes, us. We do. Instead of through yeah, we're getting lonely. Zoom and everything else that yes. we're all doing. I'm just tired of fake people. Um, <laughs> I want to see... <laughs> I mean, you're real, but you know what I mean? Yeah, but it's it is so cute. The camera. We've gotten so many cute letters lately. There is a cute boy in Missouri who watches us and someone from South Africa wrote us a little email today that was so cute and we do just love thinking about all of you in all of your places wherever you are. Yeah, I love all those lines that are coming out like we're all in this together. Yep. You know, everywhere we are. It's fun. Mm -hmm. it's I almost true. choked I feel like on I'm my way spit far just off then. On the set. <laughs> Don't choke. Okay. All right. This is Mosiah 11 through 17, a super well-known story. This is the story of King Noah and King Abinadi. Well, I want him to be king. He's not a king, <laughs> but I wanted him to be. Okay. Remember this friend? Let's bust this guy out just real quick. Okay. You hold it okay, so I don't I'll have to drop it. everything. All right. You remember Ammon came down to visit the and found Limhi and all his people in bondage. And then Limai said, oh, let's fill you in on what's happened. And then he told that whole Zenith story, how yeah, he first came down and how he yeah. jumped down here. And then he came down. So right now we're in the middle of this flashback that right now this is where they're living. But Limai is telling the story. And after Zenith dies, his son is going to take over as the king. And that is King Noah. That is so famous. And Remember, we kind of talked about that last week, that Zenith, even though he didn't do exactly what the Lord said, he he still just had, was trying to be good. But then Noah takes over. And one of the first lines about him is it says he does not walk in the ways of his father. I always love that phrase because I always think about Heavenly Father. Like mm. when someone's like, I walk in the ways of my father. Yeah. Like I live the way he would have me live. And Noah does not. He does not walk in the ways of his father. So that's where we're going to start this one. And this is all, there's no like jumping around time in this one. Bless. We are just <laughs> in the story of the flashback right now still. And we're going to be in it. So um, we want to start by talking about how amazing it is that one person can have such a powerful influence. You should scoot that way a little bit so they can see all oh, that part of the book. Okay. Good job. How am I? Good. Okay. Should I do that again? We're going to talk about, <laughs> but really it is intriguing how one decision and one person and just in this story, we have that a couple of times. Yeah. You're going to want to be one. watching for the power of one right. for sure. Um, as we're going and Noah, for sure, that's where we start. Just yeah. the power of one man to corrupt an entire nation. So if you just look here, um, this is Limhi kind of telling the story where he's just like, let me tell you why we ended up um, turning against God. Because they go into bondage, but the reason they go into bondage is because they abandon the strength and power of God in their life. And he says, let me tell you how that happened. It was one man, our leader, whose name was Noah. And starting there, verse one, he doesn't walk in the ways of his father, but then starting in verse two, and we have on the study guide sheet, just a spot where you can see like, this is what the reign and life and personality and decisions of Noah looked like that ended up influencing the rest of everybody else, right? And you're going to find these, um, as you look through chapter 11, all the way through there, we'll just point out some of them because it's interesting to see as you look at who he was as a leader, he did not keep the commandments of God. Um, he took everything to support himself. He took away all of the priests who had been consecrated by his dad and replaced them with all his own people. So there was no... Um, what would have been righteous men in government? They were just, everything was new. And I like when, right before we started, as we were writing this up here, um, and like, you're not going to know anybody who replaces priests and puts wicked priests <laughs> in their spot, but you might know somebody who removes men of God, who wants to push people of God out of their circle of influence, out of, mm -hmm. I don't want anything to do with them type of person, you know? Yep. Um, in verse 6, he was lazy. Um, he worshipped things that weren't God. There were whoredoms. Um, he became idolatrous in verse 7. In verse 11, um, they spoke lying and vain words to people. In verse 12, um, it talks about how he built a high tower 
um, by where the temple was, almost as if instead of letting the temple be the watchtower over the people, Noah was going to build his own tower and he was going to be the watch care over the people. And it's interesting that he also dolls up the temple, like makes it really fancy. But then you also like, I like that one to think about because at first glance, you're like, oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. He like put the fancy Italian marble in there for everybody. But it's like, what were his motives for doing something like that? Um, In 14, he placed his heart upon riches. Um, He... It talks about in 15 that he planted vineyards in abundance and wine in abundance. And what you want to be thinking about there is just excess. It's just a lot of excess. Um, In verse 19, pride. Um, So it's all of these things. This is the man who Abinadi is going to come to. Is this man who it's all about him. Um, And it's lies and it's deceit and it's money and it's whoredoms and it's... um, putting his own people in high places so he can do what he wants to do. And I sometimes think like the worst, like if you go back to that very first one, that verse two, where it starts off, it just says that he walked after the desires of his own heart. Yep. And like all the wine vineyards that are being, you know, taken care of there by other people. So all of this he's doing at the cost and expense of other people. And that seems to be what was the most corrupting about it was you stopped caring about people and you stopped caring about God. He really broke and shattered the two great commandments. And I think that's what was most corrupting about him. Yeah, that's such a good him. point. That's really good. Um, and then Abinadi comes. And I love, I wish we could see this movie because I love what happens is they bring in Abinadi and um, he's going to start telling him all this stuff. And in verse 27, the first two things that he says that are kind of a standout are who is Abinadi and who is the Lord? That's his personality. Like if you could sum up his whole self into two phrases, that would be King Noah, right? Right. Just who is Abinadi? Why should I even care about Abinadi and who even is the Lord, right? I have everything under control in here. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, oh. that's interesting that like you see these great kings, you know, I almost said the great kings of the past, but that's a uh, <laughs> Lion King line. Um, but the, the greatest kings that you see in the Book of Mormon are those who understand that they also have a king. Right. And he doesn't. You know, he's just like, I'm running my own life. Everything's great. And he's just, who is the Lord? Right, which is true in the Old Testament Pharaoh, too. Pharaoh, that's Pharaoh's yeah. question. The yeah. same exact question of Moses. Who's the Lord and why should I obey his voice? That seems to be the problem. Yep. Laman and Lemuel asked the same question, right? Why should we, yeah. why should we, we don't know the Lord. Yeah, which is so interesting. And um, it's, it, Abinadi ends up leaving and then he comes back again two years later in disguise. <laughs> but he's got the worst disguise ever. <laughs> <laughs> because look at when he comes in. Where is it? Oh, chapter 12, verse yeah. 1, yeah. where he came in disguise and they knew not. And the first thing he says is, the Lord commanded me, saying, Abinadi, go and prophesy to this people. It's like, you are the worst. Disguiser <laughs> ever. <laughs> it's like the third word. Like, what does he have on one of those like little mustache things or something? And he's he's I not very am good. Abinadi. He's not very good. Also, he tricking. doesn't have like a name that is like everyone else had. <laughs> yeah. He just, has his own <laughs> name. How many have been a I are love there? that part. I just love, love this guy. He's just great, you <laughs> know? Is. But you want to know his backstory? Every time I see that picture of him as an old man so ripped, you know, and like the leopards are there, you know what I'm talking about? I always think like, wait, we don't even know how old he is. Yes. And did he leave a wife and kids behind? Yeah. And like, I want to know his backstory story. So... i know so bad we want to watch this in video and you love that when he comes back remember when he left the last thing king noah said was who is abinadi and who is the lord and then in chapter 12 he comes in and he's like i am abinadi and in verse 3 it says and it shall come to pass that the life of king noah shall be valued even as a garment in a hot furnace for he shall know that i am the lord like if he wants to know who i am i will introduce myself (laughs) he's not going to forget it right um that you just love that god doesn't forget those kinds of statements that he's like oh if you want to know who abinadi is i'll reintroduce him and myself also um which is so interesting as he goes through and what's going to happen is these people are going to try and um confound abinadi 
in what he's doing and what's happening. And let's say first, we've had this conversation before and then I just remembered it just now that we missed this verse that back in 11 at the end, 29, it just talks about all these people are being taxed so heavily and they're being put to work and their king is taking all of their money and he's like, building his own palace and he's build he's putting his friends in and and you would think like if we caught wind or got news that our tax money was being put into like golden limousines for the president and like you know all this stuff we there would be outrage there would be like but it's interesting that it says the people were blinded yeah and they hardened their hearts and this is the state that they're all in but um i just love the concept and idea of if you're ever in uh, a dangerous or a blinded place, God will always send an Abinadi. He's always going to mm. send somebody with that message of redemption and the message of rescue and yeah. someone who can see. And I, I think that's really, really neat. Yeah, that is so good. Um, so there, um, the people get him. He's in his disguise now, but he's introduced himself as Abinadi. The yeah. people get him. They bring him in to the king and, um, they're going to start telling him, this is what is happening. This is what he's doing. And um, I love in verse 16 of chapter 12 when they say, here is the man. Um, and you, I just love that phrase when it's like exactly what you're saying. Don't you want to see him? Don't you want to see who he was? Don't you want to see the fire of testimony that just burned in his eyes when he talked? Um, I, I love the thought of that line, here is the man, Abinadi. And... Um, in verse 18, it says, and, and yeah, where is that line? Do you just say, here's the man? In oh, 16. cause it ends with that and do with him as seemeth you good. Mm. And it's like, what could Noah and the priests have done with him that really would have led to good? You yeah. know what? They, uh, they had a choice with this message. Um, and so they throw him into prison. And Noah tells all the priests to come, and they're going to try and decide what to do with him. And they say, bring him here again, and we want to question him. And we actually love this part of these um, chapters because it's interesting. Um, we have this little part right here that just says, when someone questions and accuses your faith, how do you respond in a situation like that? And we love watching Abinadi's response as his faith is accused and he's being challenged how does he respond to that? And and these answers will help us also in that same situation. It's important before we go into this to think about, you are going to be asked questions about your faith. For your whole life, that will happen. And the number one thing to do in that situation is to ask yourself the question, does this person want to know more about my beliefs? And is are they coming from a place that is genuine? Or... Are these people trying to shake me from my faith? Because those are two different conversations. And the one we're going to look at is someone who is trying to shake your faith that comes in with that kind of an intent, that their questions are coming in a way that are more accusatory than just genuine wondering about what you believe. Um, and we love what he does. It tells us in verse 19, and we want to talk about each of these things. There's going to be five things that we're going to look at. And we'll just go through each one. And maybe we can just say what the five are. Um, he answered them boldly is one. He withstood all their questions is two. He confounded them in all their words is three. Four is in um, Mosiah 17 verse nine. nine. Yeah, have that as a, a cross reference because it says he does not recall his words, right? He doesn't back down from what is true. That's number four. And then he's going to ask inspired questions and that's going to be a little bit lower right here will be number five. And number six, he's going to testify of Christ. And we're going to go into both of those. But let's just talk about um, those first ones. Do you want to do, um, he answered them boldly and withstood their questions? Yeah. It's just neat that, again, remember, this is not for a normal like discussion conversation, he's going to act a little bit differently than you would of somebody inquiring truth. But if somebody is deliberately, it says, trying to cross you or trying to accuse you, the first thing he says is, I'm going to be bold in what I answer back. Like, I'm not going to back down from what is true and I'm going to speak it with authority and I'm going to speak it with uh, belief and conviction. 
that's going to require some sort of work in the past, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're just like, I've worked through this before and this is what I know. And and you cannot tell me what I believe or what my experience was, experiences are or what I know. I, I remember growing up thinking a lot of times when people would say like, oh, you believe this and you believe that and you're wrong because of this. And I would want to say, I happen to be the world's foremost expert on what I believe. <laughs> And I've thought through it before. And so I can tell you, no, this is my belief. This is my experience. So um, I love that first one. Mm-hmm. And, and it makes you think about when President Nelson invited oh, the women the of the church thing. to yeah. have a bedrock understanding of the doctrines of the gospel. A bedrock understanding doesn't just show up overnight. Um, bedrock is strong, right? It is a strength that comes. And it comes over time. And so many times I talk to women who say, I just, I want to be a scriptorian. I want to teach out of the scriptures. I want to have that kind of knowledge. And I always say to them, it begins as simple as 10 minutes a day in your scriptures. It's making that commitment, not like an hour every day. You don't need to teach seminary. You don't need to graduate in theology. You just need to get in the scriptures every day for whatever amount of time you have. The point isn't the minutes. The point is every day, every day, every day. Remember? Yeah. Who said that? Elder Johnson? Peter yes. Johnson? And yeah, um, that's how a bedrock understanding comes. That's exactly how it comes. It just comes because every day you're thinking about questions that lead you to understand because you're the expert of your belief that leads you to understand your belief. Yeah. And I also think it doesn't have to be um, like eventually you could become bold in understanding what all your beliefs are. But there is something about the boldness that's really powerful mm-hmm. here where it's just like, um, I, I, might, I may not know much, but this one thing mm-hmm. I know and I, I know that. it certainly. And it is, um, I like how Paul says, hope is an anchor to the soul. You know, he's mm-hmm. just like, I believe in this one thing and it anchors yeah. me. That yeah, one movie, so Hope good. Floats, that's a lie. Hope don't float, <laughs> it anchors. Okay, oh, number so two awesome. is he withstood all of their questions. Um, I think it's interesting that he is going to see what it is that their questions actually are. And he wants to understand what the questions are that it is that they're asking. But also, there is a tactic of some accusing and crossing, trying to cross people by throwing question after question and confusing questions. So it's good to say, wait, what is actually the question that is being asked? And I'm not going to be thrown off guard by the fact that you have questions or that you are firing a lot of them. You know, so. Yeah, it's just taking one at a time, meeting them where they are and where you are and mm-hmm. and going mm-hmm. through and some of them you might be like I actually don't know that so let me let me find out about that um, and move to the next you know what do you know about that subject and then um, be able don't be worried about going back and asking more we also love what it talks about and he did confound them in all their words and um, we looked up what confound meant because we were like what what exactly was happening there and Remind me your definition. It, mine was to confuse. Yeah, um, same type of idea. Up, like it but, was the same type yeah. of... Um, just that he, he just stopped them for a minute and was like, okay, hold on. Let's think about your words for a minute. Let's like, let's look at them. And this does not have to be mean. And it doesn't have to be aggressive. Um, I don't think that probably is what happened there, especially when you read how this conversation is going to go. I had an experience... Um, a couple weeks ago where someone texted me a little portion of a quote and said, what do you think about this? And I could tell it was a quote that didn't sit well with them, which interested me because I was like, it actually, if you understand the context of that whole talk, I think you actually would like that quote. So what I responded back rather than trying to teach the quote was, have you read the whole talk? And the person wrote back and they were like, no, I actually haven't yet. And I wrote back and said, okay, read the whole talk and then ask me your question again. And it was so interesting because they they did take the time to read the talk. And then when they responded back, they were like, I didn't realize that that quote was out of context if you didn't understand the whole talk. Because when you understood the whole 
talk, that quote was really powerful. And it didn't matter what religion you were. It was still a powerful quote. And so sometimes confounding is the type of situation where something is mixed up, where something is confusing. And it's actually taking the time to be like, okay, I can see why you're confused by that. And if I only had that little piece of information, I might be confused too. So let me show you where you could go to get greater context or greater understanding about that before we talk about that one little piece. Sometimes that's how you confound um, someone. And the Spirit will help you. The Spirit will help you withstand questions. The Spirit will help you in that process of um, taking someone's words and trying to understand what's mixed up about those and how can I find truth within that place. We love also that he asks inspired questions. And we wrote those down right here, the verses where they are. It's so powerful to see how he crafts those questions, how he uses questions in order to, um, to, to help them enter into this conversation. And all of us are teachers. When I read things like this, it makes me realize, oh, I need to sit down and think about my questions a little bit mm -hmm. more than I do because inspired questions can be so powerful. Um, this week, as we are on Instagram, we're going to talk about how to learn to ask inspired questions, what that would look like and, and how we can get better at it. But um, I love reading like things like this, but we talked after Easter weekend about the Chosen series that we both um, talked about from Vid Angel that we love so much. And one of my favorite things from watching that series was actually watching both Nicodemus and Jesus as they responded, um, particularly because they were both responding in a situation that was much like this, that was accusatory, that people were questioning their belief or why they were reacting the way that they were. And it's interesting because None of them get in aggressive situations. Neither of them do. But the way they ask questions is so powerful. I kind of want to go back and watch all the episodes again and just write down what do I learn from how the questions were asked in that series? Because it just was powerful watching someone who is a master of asking inspired questions. Yeah, and Abinadi's questions that he gives to the priest right here and P.S. The Chosen. If you didn't catch that, <laughs> I like I, you I shouldn't have even introduced it, it because so right funny. now I want to tell you, you should be watching that instead of this. But I like that Abinadi's questions help them where he's getting at, getting to like, you, you are all missing the point is what he's doing. They ask him a question. He's like, no, you are, you're missing the point. You're in the peripherals and you're not at the heart and soul of what my message actually is. And let's just remind you again in this certain situation, like we, you're like as, as I'm listening to you talk, you're naturally leaning toward like nicer conversations. Mm -hmm. And when you read this, you will rarely be in a conversation like this, you know. And the reason he's so bold with it is because he's defending people who are being hurt by the priests. Mm -hmm. Like they are, these priests are leading people away from God in a destructive manner. And he's in cuffs, you know? <laughs> and so like this kind, this is a very, very intense scene. But you can also learn some principles of like engaging in mm -hmm. like conversation that's nice. Yeah. Because normally engaging in spiritual conversations with people who disagree are very uplifting and you're not trying to discover who's right. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, you want to end with right relationship with yeah. them and God. And, the and what can you discover? Being and... in that conversation and not contention, um, that's the feeling that you want. So, yeah. And maybe the people don't engage you that way. But for me, I always want to leave that conversation a better friend with that person than I was before the conversation started. Yeah. And so this is kind of a different type of fight you know they're throwing the first second and third punches um if you didn't get that fifth one or the fourth one it was mosiah 17 9 the one where he's just like this is what's true and i'm not backing down from it you yeah. know that's which a, is important it is really important to plant your foot um even though you're willing to engage in the conversation the things you know you know and you don't ever back down from that even if it hurts someone's feelings um 
because that, that's your belief. That's what you get to hold on to. And they get to hold on to what they believe. That's true too. It's just as true for them as it is for us. Um, and then we love five is um, testify of Christ. And that might be the most powerful thing Abinadi does in his entire sermon is that um, testifying of Christ all the way through there. And we want to start out as you're looking, um, we're going to invite you to read through chapters 14 through 16 of Mosiah. And the first thing we've done is left you a little box right here that says... Okay, before you jump into that one, let's just yeah. say this. That's, I think before we get into this 14 through 16... One of the values of the Book of Mormon, one of the things that adds into the canon of belief and, and truth on earth is, um, is an understanding about the why of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The New Testament tells the storyline really, really well, better than the Book of Mormon. But the Book of Mormon has a couple of sermon spots in it that just add an understanding of the atonement of Jesus Christ that you cannot find in such richness and abundance as you can find in the Book of Mormon. And a Benedi sermon right here is one of those spots. So this is lo- this is longer than like, well, you could take a five-minute study because five minutes with Jesus is better than five minutes anywhere else. But this is what might be a good, good like, oh, what am I learning about yeah. the why behind the atonement of Jesus Christ in... 14 through 16. So good, good study. Okay. Sorry. I just thought um, that's like really yeah. important. Like, yes. So as you're doing, you want to be learning about the atonement and you want to be watching for Jesus Christ. And one of the words that encompasses both of those things is the word redeem. And it's we, Benedict's favorite yeah, word. Yeah, he loves it. We want you to count how many times you see it in 14 through 16, particularly in chapters 15 and 16. You're going to see it so many times in there. And it's fun to just talk about um, what that word redeem means. The Greek translation of that word redeem is to preserve, deliver, rescue by any means. I love the thought of that, that it it doesn't matter what lengths he has to go to. He will preserve you, deliver you, and rescue you. That's what Abinadi is testifying of right here, which is so powerful. And I looked up um, Redeem before I came Mm. over, actually, in the 1828 dictionary. Mm. Sometimes I do that with the Book of Mormon because that's the understanding of certain words in the way Joseph Smith understood the words. So it's kind of neat to look up in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary some words. And Redeem says this, to purchase back, to ransom, to liberate or rescue from captivity or bondage, pay an equivalent as to redeem prisoners or goods or to repurchase that which has been sold. Hmm. Which is, which kind is of so fun neat, especially when cost. he's in bondage. Yes. Yeah. And oh, that's so fun. To by think any about. means, um, he's going to be willing to do that. Um, we love looking at that. Um, we love talking about who is the seed of Jesus Christ. Oh, this is such a cool part. Um, I, y'all, you... Okay, listen. Mm-hmm. I know you binge watching Netflix. You need to binge Abinadi for a minute, okay? For a <laughs> night. This whole sermon has like... is He gave it all together. So sometime in your life, maybe soon, you want to read the whole thing as one experience. Because the question that starts off the entire thing is that question from the priests um, in chapter 12 where they quote from Isaiah and they ask, what does this verse mean? And they say, this is back in 12 again, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation and saith to Zion, your God reigneth. Like, what is that? They're trying to ask. And of course they pick Isaiah, right? Because he's so cryptic. So like, what's that mean? And then he starts going through and like, you're missing the whole point and everything. And then in chapter 14, he quotes an entire chapter from Isaiah. I love when he drops that bomb on them because they're like, do you know what this one verse means of Isaiah? And he's like, don't play games with me. And then recites an entire chapter um, from Isaiah, which might be... One of our favorite chapters mm. from Isaiah. It's the most um, Jesus' sacrifice rich chapter. Yeah. It just, you can see his life and his condescension from beginning to end in this one. All through 14, 
This is yeah. the one you'll recognize. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, that, that he knew grief well. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. I won't go through all of them. I can't help it. I might get sucked into it all, but you're wondering why well, I'm going to talk about the seed, and I'm going to tell you right now. One of the things that he says is in verse 8, it says, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Back in ancient times, it was your seed that carried on your mission. And they carried on the message that you had, like your kids and grandkids. And Isaiah says, and he will die. And and who will declare his message? Who will take it to everyone else? Because he has no kids. And so in chapter 15... Mosiah, not Mosiah, he wanted to be Mosiah, um, of Mosiah, Abinadi says, let me tell you who his seed is. Let me tell you who's going to take his message to the world. And in 11, it says, it's those who've heard his words and those who believed that he would redeem his people and those who've looked forward to that day of redemption. Those are the people who are going to go to all the world and they're going to say, I have a message of a man who redeemed us and and that's such a rad thing and then and then he comes back to the question they asked him and it said how beautiful upon the mountain mm-hmm. are the feet of those people that publisheth good news of good and how beautiful are his feet the one who actually will redeem us oh such a yeah, it's so good good part there's and so, there's good so in many this. good one-liners in as you go through 15 and 16 you love um in verse 18 where you were just quoting he's called the founder of peace which is such a great name wait what chapter oh um, right there 15 yeah 18, 15, 15 18. verse 18 which makes me think i think john hilton's book is called founder of peace is it i love that name it should be yeah i think it is it just came out and just the thought of that um, we also love, um, oh, this question in chapter 16, verse seven, if Christ had not risen, just the thought of like what, what we wouldn't have mm. if that hadn't have happened and particularly right on the, um, heels of Easter. And then eight, cause seven's like, this is what the world would have been like if there was no Christ. But then I love yeah. in eight when it I says, but there was one. You know, but there is a Christ. There is a resurrection. There is a victory. So let your heart settle in. What if for a minute? But then let me come back and say, there there is there is one. And it's so interesting because this is long before the resurrection has even happened. And do you love his passion for a resurrection that didn't even happen yet? And you think about the the saints before the um, atonement of Jesus Christ had to look forward to that moment and trust it would happen, that it it really was going to be as everybody said. And for us, we have to look back and Mm -hmm. trust that it happened and it really will be as everyone says. It's just so interesting how faith is both forward and backwards, that it's that moment was so crucial. And you love that Isaiah, that Abinadi, he's been every name in the whole book today. (laughs) Abinadi um, is so passionate about something that is still um, so many years ahead of where they are. Um, we also love this line. This is probably our favorite verse in these chapters about Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he says, He is the light and the life of the world, yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened, yea, and also a life which is endless, that there can be no more death. It's such a good description of Jesus Christ. So in these verses, and chapters, especially if you know that he is about to die, Yes. When, you know, Abinadi is about to die and he's just like, but you cannot snuff out my message because it's his message and you cannot end life because there's no death. Oh! And we left you this whole square right here to write down everything, all the Jesus verses that you love. We just want you to put them. There's not enough space. Okay, then we're going to Oh, you have this whole page, the blank page next to it. That's why we put them in, I forgot. (laughs) 
She's so happy. Okay. I was sad for a second. I was like, there's no room. There's We're too many good things. to get to the best part, everybody. Even though he thinks this is the best part. There's one more part that is so good. Jesus. Because you remember how we part. started at the beginning with the power of one man to corrupt an entire nation, which is so intriguing that mm -hmm. one man can have that much power. But it's interesting because here you have Abinadi bearing the last testimony of his life. It is his last lecture. It's the most important thing he can say. And for all he knows when he dies, it affected no one. But we learn in chapter 17, and there's just this one verse that we love, the first four lines, but there was one. And it's so interesting that we started with one man who could corrupt an entire nation. And we're going to end Abinadi's story with one man who is going to raise up a whole nation um, for good because of, of one man's testimony. And you just watch this power of one that is happening um, as you go through this book. Yeah, and in that way... Abinadi becomes a type and shadow of Jesus because he lays down his life, delivers this message, lays down his life, and then it ends up saving a whole nation mm. of people. The whole Book of Mormon will now shift from this line it's been following of passing the plates and where the camera has been following. It's going to shift over to Alma. He's the one. Should we just tell you? Mm -hmm. And it's going to just now affect generations because of, of that one man Testimony. who laid down his life, yeah. you know? It's so interesting. So we do, as you go through these chapters, we really want you to focus on that power of one. You're going to see it in Noah. You're going to see it in Abinadi. And now we're going to see it in Alma. Um, when you think about how the Lord works with people, when you think of the purpose God has in mind, don't ever underestimate your individual power, what you have to offer. And especially in a situation where you get to bear testimony of what you believe, because that moment can have so much effect. And maybe you served a mission and you only met one person. Or if you were a Benedite, maybe you served a mission and you don't even know the one person. Mm -hmm. who you influenced. But God will take that one and and m multiply it. That's what he does. And also don't forget just how, um, you just said how, how important it is to remember like the one, I also think it's so important to remember like your own worth. Like I think if Alma had a conversation with Abinadi after he died and he said, you gave your whole life so that I could hear it. I think of Bennett, I would say it was worth it. Mm. It was worth everything I gave up and the jail and the burning of the stake so that you could hear that message. Like that God is still doing that. Like you are worth him sending a into your life for mm. and, and any and everything by any means yeah. he is going to redeem by any means because you're worth it. Yeah. Right? So good. Such a good lesson. Oh, I love this one. Abinadi, goodbye, my friend. And goodbye to all of you. <laughs>